open up your Bibles with me to Hebrews 12. But what I want to do is talk about running your race. Somebody say, run your race. Amen. Say, I need to run my race with perseverance. Amen. And so what I want to do is read the whole passage here, speak on it just a little, and then get to the second passage that I didn't get a chance to in the first service. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Come on, can I hear an amen to them? How many know we got to throw off the sin and the things that hinder us? Man, I got a lot of things to throw off that aren't just sins that are hindrances. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be a hindrance. Otherwise, I might have to throw you off. Come on, somebody. You got to throw off some stuff. I'm telling you, it's not just sin. You got to throw off some other stuff. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and protector of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How many believe he's there right now? Everything's under control. How many believe everything's under control? He's on his throne. Amen. Consider him who endured such oppositions from sinners so you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let me just review this for those who didn't hear it in the first service, uh, those who were coming early, as I said, to the second service. We know by the preaching here, and I believe it's Paul. It may not uh, come across exactly the way Paul's epistles do, and we believe that's because it's a sermon that was dictated and then made into a book. So most of the early church saw the author of Hebrews as Paul, though it doesn't say specifically most of the letters start with an apostle telling us who they are and who the audience is. We know Hebrews is written to primarily the Jewish audience, but as I said, the author remains a little bit anonymous, so I put this towards Paul, so if I say that, you know why. I believe that Paul, as the author, is reminding us that in heaven right now, there is a cloud of witnesses watching us. That does not mean we start praying to the cloud of witnesses. How many believe we don't need to pray to them? We don't need to pray to them. As a matter of fact, as you heard today in the baptism, we've seen many people come from Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox, etc., to Christ, get baptized, because baptizing a baby doesn't count. You can't make a confession of Christ. And I've never heard, out of all of my 20-plus years of ministry, I have never heard a Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox ever come to me and say, you know what? I miss praying to the saints. I just wish I could pray to Mary some more. I miss that feeling. No, as a matter of fact, they come to me and they say all the time, I have never been closer to God than I am right now. Can I hear an amen? I'm telling the truth. My parents came out of Catholicism. My dad has never said, oh, you know what? Sometimes life just gets so hard. Jesus isn't enough. I need to give St. Bartholomew a call. Never. It's always those, and listen, I don't mean to be mean or rude, but I got to be honest. It's always those who do not have a great relationship with God, don't understand how to hear him in their heart, that feel they need all this extra help. You don't need his mother. You don't need his brother. You don't need his friends. All you need is him. Call on Jesus. You'll never be disappointed. I promise you, learn learn to cultivate that relationship with Jesus, and you'll never be the same. But the Bible does say here that there are and they're watching. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to enter into our world because that's another mistake that people make here, that they're going to come into our world in the middle of the night. Grandma's going to come and tell us her favorite recipe and that she loves us and misses us. If that is what you see in the middle of the night, cast it out in Jesus' name, and you'll watch a whale make noises she has never made before. Because familiar spirits come in the shape and size of relatives to deceive us. You might say, oh, but she says so many nice things. How could that be an evil spirit? Like I said, say, go in the name of Jesus and watch what happens to that visitation. The Bible only talks about one time someone came that wasn't brought by Jesus that was already dead. And that was in the time of Saul looking for a word from the Lord because Samuel wasn't given giving him one, and he went to the witch of Endor. This is a real story. And then tried to conjure up Samuel to give a word. So he had it all backwards. So don't be like backslidden Saul who goes to a witch to conjure up a dead prophet. Can I hear another amen to that? That's not the story that we follow. Now, when Jesus was on the mountain of transfiguration, did he bring with him Moses and Elijah? Yes. So if Jesus wants to do that, Jesus can do that. Now, here's where we get the Book of Mormon. He says, Jesus 
Jesus came with John the Baptist and others and, and so forth. And so he tries to get around that. But then in Jesus, of his vision, gave him a false gospel. So if you do see a vision of Jesus with some of the saints, you better make sure it's the gospel of the Bible. Otherwise, cast out that fake Jesus in the name of Jesus and watch that Jesus make noises you've never heard before. Because the Bible warns us that spirits can take on images and appear even as an angel of light. So do not be deceived by spiritual visitations. That does not trump the word of God. Now to the good part. The Bible says that we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. That means they understand what we're going through. They're watching our lives in some way, and they're wanting us to pray to Jesus, to see Jesus do the same things in our lives that he did in their lives. If you go back to Hebrews 11, it lists off who those people were that have become saints uh, and that are in heaven. By the way, there are saints on earth because the Bible says that. How many believe that? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, to the saints at Corinth, those are holy people, and they're saints in heaven. We are saints here. They're saints there. And, and because of their living testimony, their living witness, as Hebrews 11 talks about, we should be encouraged to do these things, to throw off that which hinders us and the sin that entangles us. And if you want to hear more about it, go listen to it online, and you'll hear I talked about it, but it's not just sin that we throw off. It's also hindrances. So I talked about how God told me to take off earrings that I used to wear the hoops and how God did that for me. That doesn't mean you have to. It just means I had to because God was speaking. So it's not just sin. It can also be hindrances. How many know chocolate cake is not a sin, but it can hinder you getting in shape? Amen. And I know round is a shape, but I don't want to be round. Amen. I want a six pack, not a cake. Okay. I'm going for it. I got all winter now to do this thing. I got all winter. I didn't get it done last year. I got this year to do it. Okay. So don't, so don't get in your mind, well, I don't sin. I don't need to listen to God anymore. You, you know, you could become lazy in your walk with God, and God is saying, I know this is not a sin to watch Netflix, but I'm telling you not to watch Netflix because I want you to pray. So it becomes a hindrance to you. I know for, for others, you know, um, listening to secular music is not a hindrance, but God says for you it's a hindrance. Throw it off and just listen to worship music. Why do we do that? So we can run our race. And that's what the message was primarily in the first service. But what I want to do now is get us to the point where I couldn't get them in first service and combine it here so if they listen to this service, they'll get the other part. You listen to that uh, service, you'll get the first part. Let's go down now to verse 4. In verse 4, it says, in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. How many of you have resisted sin before? The Bible says to resist the devil and he will flee. But did you ever shed blood? Did it ever get so hard that you shed blood? No. So the Bible is saying we will be tempted, but that is not an excuse to give in to sin. Has the temptation of pornography made you bleed yet? Have you bled yet? No. So you keep fighting that temptation. But even if it costs you your blood, it should be worth it. But who fought temptation even to the point of blood? Jesus, was it the cross? No, where did he find temptation? Before the cross in the garden. What happened? He sweat drops of what? Blood. And they say mentally this is possible to have so much stress in your mind that a headache can form that can cause blood vessels to burst. And so Jesus, whatever struggle he was going through beyond our understanding, caused a physical symptom for him to literally sweat out blood because of that stress and because of that trauma that he was facing. And so the Bible says even then he did not give in to sin. So don't make any excuses for you to sin. You haven't even gone to that point. And if you did, you still would not have an excuse. Amen? Because the Bible says he will keep you from temptation. So now let's get into where we need to live. Verse 5 and onward is going to teach us some things here. And have you completely forgot this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? So notice he's starting off with a rhetorical question. Have you forgot this? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he what? The one he what? loves, thank you, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. So if you are being rebuked by God, that means he what? He loves you, and if he chastens you, that means he accepts you as what? A child, as a son, as a daughter. 
in our race of Christianity, it is so easy to get discouraged by temptation and then to think that when the Lord is rebuking us and correcting us that he doesn't love us. Read verse 7 with me out loud. One, two, three. Endure hardship as discipline. One more time. Endure hardship as discipline. Thank you. This is how we are to look at our hardships. Not that God doesn't love us, but as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. In the King James, you are a bastard. You are a bastard. That is not a word we should use in vulgarity, but I'm just showing you in the King James where that word is used appropriately. We say the word illegitimate. So this is not a thing where you don't know who your daddy is. That's what a bastard is. That's what an illegitimate child is. You don't know who your daddy is. The Bible is being very clear and upfront in this declaration that everyone with a good father undergoes discipline. And the Bible says you are not illegitimate. You are not a bastard. You are true sons and daughters. How many are true sons and daughters today? Amen? So even if you have had a terrible relationship with your earthly parents or your father, that is not the way God is going to treat you, nor does he hold that against you. He welcomes you into his family as he welcomes everyone. But for those of us, by God's grace, who have been given great parental uh, advice and great parental you know, examples, we should see in them that they disciplined us for our good. How many had good parents that disciplined you for your good? How many know it didn't always feel good? It was for your good, but it didn't always feel good. And you know what? I do that same thing with my kids. I have not gotten to the point yet where spanking them hurts, hurts, them, uh, hurts me more than it hurts them. I, I still think it hurts them more than it hurts me. But I do spank, and I have a rule on how I do it. And I got a couple of them right here, and they know that I've taken care of them even after the spankings. But they've all gone through our spankings. And then I say to them, if you're good, after 11, you'll never get spanked again because I don't want to have to take it to a whooping. You know what I'm saying? Like after you're a certain age, it goes from a spanking to a whooping. Amen. How many of you were whooped? I was whooped. I'm not going to ask you how many, because the next level is how many of you were beat. No, we're not going to, we're not going to bring that out today. But some of us were beat, and mom needs to repent today. Dad needs to repent. Seriously, seriously. I mean, that's not funny in some ways, but you get my point. But I was definitely whooped. I was, I was whooped. I was not just spanked, and I wasn't just, you know, disciplined. I was whooped by different things that my mom could get a hold of, okay? But here's the thing. Let's back up to what is good discipline. Let's back up to how I would discipline my children. There, there's a certain uh, punishment that fits their crime of what they did. It's done in grace and love with me under self-control. It's not just to be punitive, just to be painful. It's meant to be restorative. And the reason why I believe in the pain that they're supposed to feel to a point without lasting bruises or cuts or things like that is because they're supposed to be reminded of on that soft, bubbly tushy that, that most of my kids have, okay? They're supposed to be reminded that sin is death. That it leads to pain, not, not, like I said, not abuse, not blood and bruises and those kinds of things, but I still believe in what they call corporal punishment, that kind of discipline, because it reminds us sin is painful. And the Bible is using that exact same language here. You are a child of God, and you are not to think about your hardships, the things you're going through in life, as God being abusive to you, but rather that he is disciplining you. And when needed, he is rebuking you and he is chastening you because he loves you. Can I hear an amen to that? He loves us. Verse 9, moreover, we all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his what? 
Holiness. Everybody say holiness. Amen. We are going to share in the character of God. How many of you had parents that would say to you, hey, they can do that over here, but you're not doing that here. You're a, for me, it was you're a wyrostic. That's This is how we are here. Well, mom, dad, they do it over there. I don't care about what they do over there. You, you are mine. You are a wyrostic. You are of this family, and you're going to learn our ways. Jesus is the same way as God the Father is disciplining us. Jesus comes to us in those times and relates to us because he himself in the flesh endured these things. Jesus did not come as superhuman. He was always God. Remember that. But he limited his experience to that of a human. So what we go through in temptation, he went through in temptation. Obviously, he did in sin, praise God. What we go through when we feel our skin pierced open and abused, or, you know, when people abuse it, that's what he felt when he was whipped on the cross. And remember, that wasn't the father beating and whooping him. That was evil, wicked people. But it's his father taught him how to endure those hardships, taught him how not to give up through those times. Are you listening? And so we are in this world, and we may suffer, and we got to remember what comes from the devil and what comes from our God. There are things that come from the devil, temptations to sin. God will never tempt us. Hurt, pain, sickness, disease, you know, uh, mental anguish. This will all come from the devil, and he'll use others to do it. And we are not to give up in those times because God has trained us and made us strong in discipline so that we can go through it. Why do I discipline my children? So that in a world that's wicked and vile, they'll stand out and share in the righteousness of God and not give up when things get hard. You know, with that old saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. They need to understand in a safe place, in an environment like this, that my children can understand that if I'm disciplining, if I'm teaching them, it's so that when they're out in the world, in a world that's dog eat dog, there is no respect for them, there is no kindness there, that they will be able to endure it and make it through. When you think about people going into the military, it's not that the sergeant is their enemy. It's not that the sergeant wants to shoot them. It's not that the sergeant, the drill sergeant in this example, wants them to be blown up, but he's going to use all of those examples to train them. And a good sergeant does that. Can I hear an amen? The Bible says that we are living in a wicked world, that we should not think it's strange when we go through hardships, but we should know that God is disciplining us through those hardships to teach us to endure that that which comes against us to destroy us. The Bible always talks about God uplifting us and purifying us and disciplining us for our good, but then it talks about the devil stealing and killing and destroying and using uh, people to do those kinds of things, and we are to endure it. Verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. If you're going to the gym, right, how many of you know it doesn't feel pleasant all the time? Right? They say, you know, sweat is like weakness leaving the body. It's your flesh's tears. How many have had sweat before? When you go there, your body is saying, what are you doing to me? What is going on? I want to sit down. I want to eat some pizza. I want to be in a place that feels good. But you're whooping that body into shape, aren't you? How many know when you're tearing your muscle in the right way by doing good exercises, you're giving the muscle an opportunity to build more muscle, to fill in with the proteins and the vitamins, but it doesn't feel good in the present. Once again, we're not talking about overtraining. We're not talking about sweating till you pass out. We're saying good discipline here does not feel pleasant at the time but painful. Started going back to the gym. I pretty much took six months off so I could be on the boat and do wakeboarding. And that's kind of not really the gym, okay? I thought it was, but it's really not because it's just like using one set of muscles, which don't get me wrong, if you haven't used those before, it does kind of hurt and you go, you go through a sore period before. But going back to the gym, bench pens- pressing, and then doing leg extensions with the, you know, the uh, kind of squats, but I do it with the sitting down leg press. Man, I was so sore. But do you know, you know, if you've done this before. The soreness is what? A good thing. It's not a bad thing. I have to go through that so that I can get my muscles back and look like some of you guys, right? I have to do that so that Berto has something to achieve in life, some goal to achieve. He wants to be strong like Pastor. Have the muscles. I got to live up to this. I'm 43 now. You know, a lot of young guys coming around me, they don't even think I have muscles anymore. Pastor, you can't do that. And I'm like, yes, I can. I believe it or not, I still can. 
But it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. Man, it is not pleasant. You, you'll hear me groan. You'll hear me grunt. You'll, you'll see me, uh, you know, if you went to the gym, it's not pleasant. Somebody say it's not pleasant. It's painful. But later on, however, hallelujah, I'm going to take off my shirt one day and have a six-pack. Praise God. And listen, one day, right now, you're going to look back on the discipline you receive from the Lord, the correction on what you can watch and not watch and who to hang around with and who not to hang around with and what words to speak and what words not to speak. And everyone around you didn't care and they were undisciplined, but you were. The Bible says later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That's why when you'll go through the situations of this world, people will look at you and they'll say, how are you making it through like the way you are? See, because if you come to the gym in, what, about three months, you may look at me and be like, whoa, Pastor, how do you lift all that weight? No, I'm kidding, but I hope somebody says it one day. Wow, Pastor, how do you do it? And I'll be like, well... Three months ago, I was super sore, came home, cried to my wife for a while, took Advil for three days, and didn't give up, and now I can do this. I would love, guess what, boys and girls, I would love to be able to bench 300 pounds again. That was my goal. I used to be able to do that. Now, granted, I weighed close to 300 pounds at that time. I was a big boy, bouncing it off the belly. But I want to tell you that I really want to do it. I want to do it, Berto. I want to hit 300 again. I only weigh around 220. I want to get down to the low one, uh, the, the low 200s or 190-ish, and boom, push off 100 more pounds than what I weigh. That's man goals right there. It's man goals, y'all. And I want to be able to leg press a G. I want to leg press a thousand pounds. I've gotten close to about 800 pounds. Number muscle right here. That's where my kids get the badunka dunk that we spank sometimes. But I want to be able to push out a G. Be like, whoa, Pastor, how do you do that? Well, I want to say, man, it's because I stuck with it. I didn't give up this winter and just say, well, I'll do it in the summer. Because there's always an excuse. There's always an excuse. I'm looking at Joe B. He's come to the gym with me, right? We set rock climbing goals as well because my gym has a rock climbing uh, wall. And you want to climb the hard side now, don't you? And it was a little embarrassing when your pastor did it. And you didn't. It wasn't a little embarrassing. Because you're supposed to say, what's the difference between the youth pastor and the senior pastor? And the joke is about 20 pounds because we're supposed to be out of weight and out of shape. But then when I outdo the youth pastor, when I outdo the youth pastor, Pastor, that's a bad day, Jack. No, I'm kidding. That's, I'm just kidding. I just got a lot of practice. I got all the moves climbing up there, okay? But, here, but here's the thing. It doesn't feel good at first. See, he didn't see me at the rock wall the days I kept slipping and falling. Hopefully, I was an encouragement to you while you were there. I was nice. I'll say, hey, it's no big deal. I didn't get it at first because, you know, there's different routes. There's different degrees of difficulty. But he wasn't there when I kept falling. He wasn't there. Literally, uh, on that rock wall, like some days I would get home and all of my forearms would just feel so tore up. My, my uh, toes were hurting because you're digging into these little holds with your toes. You're wearing like little elf shoes, way tighter than these. And you're just like holding on. You're like, I want to fall. But you're like, I can't hold on anymore. And then you fall and then it hurts and you get back up and you fall. And, and you were and you were good because you did the other side, the side my kids do, but you were awesome at that, right, Lucas? The left side. He did the left side, the side you all knock out in like a minute. He did in five minutes, but that's okay. He got it. But if we, if we don't give up, we can reach our goals physically. How about spiritually? How about spiritually? So you're looking at your life right now going, yeah, I still take the name of the Lord in vain. I shouldn't do that. Uh, when I get mad at work, I curse. And, and uh, sometimes I take a double, triple look at the woman next to me or somebody walking down the street. Okay, so what do we do with those issues? Do we just throw it out and be like, well, I guess you didn't get all that when you got saved. So whatever you got when you were saved, that's just the way you're going to be now. No, you get disciplined. And you allow the Lord to correct you and rebuke you and to chasten you. And as you get sensitive to the inner voice of the Lord, you won't need someone else to say it to you. But sometimes it takes somebody else to say it to you. And you shouldn't be offended by that because they're like your trainer. They're your accountability partner. They're there to help you. 
this is the honest to God truth. When I first got saved, I was still smoking, and I wasn't convicted. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. So I go out with my friend, and he had grown up in church, and he had already been churchified, if you know what I mean. He wasn't just sanctified. He was churchified. He was saying glory, hallelujah at the restaurant. Man, he was, he was all in. And I was so impressed with him, but I literally lit up. This is when you could still smoke in a restaurant. I'm like, cool, dude. I love Jesus too, man. We're just talking. Yeah, man, Jesus is awesome, man. He saved me the other day. And he's looking at me all crooked. I'm telling you the truth. And he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. What do you mean? I literally did not know what he was stopping the convo for because I just lit up and I was just talking. I just, I love Jesus, man. I'm just going to tell you. He's so awesome. Like I said, this was before you could vape and smell like cotton candy. This is like when you like smoke Marlboros and stuff like that. I'm smoking a Marlboro, okay? And he looked at me and he's like, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to smoke, Joe. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? You know, and he's like, well, you know, it's not going to send you to hell, but it'll make you smell like you've been there, you know. And then then he was like, the big problem is, is it ruins your testimony. You don't have any discipline. You're basically showing the world that you're still addicted to what they're addicted to. God wants you to have a long life. Your body is the temple. And he was just hitting me with it. And then I went back home and I prayed and I go, God, is that what you're saying? And God's like, of course I've been saying that. You have not been listening to me, so I sent you somebody else. Nine times out of ten, when you are hearing these kinds of things from people, it's because you have not been listening to what God has been saying to you in private. But as you learn to discern his word better, you'll begin to understand he speaks to us on those kinds of things. So I said, you know, in prayer, Lord, I don't know how to quit. I've never quit anything like this other than the drugs that, Lord, you took me uh, off of. But, I, you know, I don't know what else to do. What, what should I do? And he said, the same way you quit the drugs, I'm going to have you quit this. Throw it out, never touch it again, and I'm going to set you free. And then I became a bum. Then I was bumming cigarettes off everybody. I was like, man, I don't have cigarettes. Jesus told me to throw them out, but I still want to smoke right now. You're smoking. Can I get a cigarette? And this is God is my witness, man. I'm telling you, I wasn't born saved, sanctified, like uh, born again, like how you see me now, okay? This has been a work in progress. How many are thankful you're still a work in progress? God is doing something through, through the discipline and behaviors and all of those things. I do believe our salvation is complete in Christ, righteous and perfect and whole. We're not earning more salvation. Like, you know, we first started off 10% saved, and if we would die, they would have to scan our, 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 our spirit a few times and go, mm, I'm not sure you're coming in yet. Boop, no. No, no, the angel, let's scan them again and, you know, wipe down the card or something. Let's scan them again, Jesus. No, when you're saved, you're saved, okay? But you do change over time in your behavior. You should change over time in your discipline and the way you look at life. And so what I realized was as a new Christian that the same way God took the big bad drugs and alcohol and partying and sex outside of marriage from me is the same way he'll do the cigarettes. It's just with cigarettes, when I, when I got tempted, I would just give into it and then say, well, it's not so bad. You know, it's not so bad as drinking. It's not so bad as uh, doing drugs. It's not so bad as having sex. This is not so bad. But this is what God taught me, and I'm sure many of you have heard it. Whatever you tolerate will dominate you. Whatever you allow to go undisciplined will discipline and control you. You are only as strong as your greatest weakness. And so what I began to realize is this was something that if I didn't take serious and allow God to train me, that I would be smoking. I would be smoking. Would you, you, know, would you honor me as a pastor as the way you do now if I was still smoking? If I'm trying to help you get free from something and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to help you get free from this thing. Let me talk to you about this. You know, would, you, would you receive that from me? No. You would look at me and say, come on, pastor. You need to learn how to get free yourself. But it took discipline, and so that probably took one of the longest things to do. Eventually, I stopped bumming, and I trusted God, and if I wouldn't touch it, he would take away that nicotine desire, and then I never smoked again. Amen? And that was the same thing with cursing. That came more natural. Some people were testifying, well, it comes natural for me to cuss, man. It's, it's like it's my second nature. And really, you know, they'll try to justify it. Really is a cuss word really a bad thing? You know, because there are some people who deserve it. And then they'll bring up the Bible and some of the bad things that God said about people in the Bible. Because, you know, like Mr. T said, I pity the fool. And then you call people fools. If I can call them a fool, why can't I call them this? And, but here's the point. The Bible says don't let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth. And you have to begin to get disciplined. And so I just began to, to ask the Lord, Lord, I only want to say in this situation what you would say. 
And man, I learned a lot of Christian cuss words that the Lord would convict me over, but people wouldn't think were that, that bad. You know, like, have you ever watched the elf and, uh, you know, he does something wrong and they say, you're a cottonhead and ninny moggin. Does anybody remember that? Those, those are like kind of like Christian cuss words, you know? Like, you're a silly willy. I've used that in anger before. And you're looking, you know, you might be the person across the, you know, the waiter or wherever I'm getting angry, you know, at the, at the airport. You are a silly willy. What is wrong with you? And I'm like literally talking to them like that. And of course, they're looking at me like, what in the world are you doing? You're not going to cuss me out. You're going to call me a silly willy? This is so silly. Like my word silly has become like that word that you fill in when you're angry. And I'm just being honest with you. Pray for me. Stretch your hands towards me right now and pray to the Lord. In el nombre de Jesus, that's my pastor. Please, por favor, touch him, Lord. Touch him real good. This is what you're praying for me because I still have these weird ways of getting angry. And the Lord's like, I don't care if you called him a silly willy. It's still wrong. You don't have permission to let those words come out of your mouth towards this person. And the Lord will discipline you, and he'll teach you. I've begun to uh, get so disciplined with those, those things that I've said that now the Lord has done this to me. And I'm serious. If you have ever been in this place, ask the Lord to give you this uh, as a reminder, as a way to stay disciplined. Anybody you offend with your words, you have to go back to and apologize. You will stop that real quick. I'm telling you, God, as my witness, I have had to come back to the post office Go talk to the person at the post office that I basically called a silly willy and say, you remember me from about like 10 minutes ago and I got mad with you here? I just had to come back and say I'm sorry. God will hold you accountable to things like that. There was one pastor, he told a story that, you know, as his church got bigger, he couldn't recognize everybody. And one time he was at the airport and they messed up everything. And while he was getting mad at the, the you know, the flight attendant person that works there, you know what I'm saying. As he's getting mad, one of the other ladies walk over and go, hey, pastor, what's going on? And then it just, he just, you know, he felt so humbled, so prideful. Like, oh my goodness, I don't want someone from my church to see how I'm talking to their coworker, how embarrassing. But how many know Jesus is listening? Jesus is listening to our words. Jesus is watching what we're watching. Jesus is with us at all times. And the Bible says that we should accept his discipline because he loves us and we get the privilege to share in his holiness. I love it. This is all glory to God. This is not a boast of my flesh at all. This is a glory to God praise. I love it when I hang around people, whether it's in my hobbies or in my neighborhood, and they'll say something like, man, I never hear you cuss. Why is that? And I'll say, man, because I love Jesus. Jesus set me free from cussing. What a testimony that now people would say that about me. Or when they're around me, when they cuss, they feel convicted. Have you gotten that saved yet? Is there anybody here that saved where your friends feel convicted when they cuss around you? They're like, oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that around you. Why? Because they know as your friend. We're, we're not talking about the people who don't care about you. We're talking about as you get to know people on your job, in your life, even your family members, that they'll even start to get convicted. That's just the words. Some of you come from the background that I do as well, and they know when they're around me not to talk about drugs, not to talk about alcohol and getting drunk in that way around me because they get convicted. Some of my friends, you know, they want to talk about old stories, and then the other ones will tell them, no, man, he doesn't want to talk about that. Those aren't the same to him. I don't look back at my old stories and say how great they are. I, I look back at my old stories and say how great God is for getting me out of that garbage. <laughs> Amen. Some people, you listen to them tell their old stories, and it's like, man, they, they want to go back to that pit and to that mire. You know, I look back at that and say, man, you are so good, God, for getting me out of it. I can't believe you loved a fool like me, a, a wretch. I was a wretch, Jesus. So what areas is God disciplining you in? The uh, beginning of this passage talked about us running our race and looking towards that cloud of witnesses. And in those cloud of witnesses, you can see the struggles that they've had, and we can identify with them, but we're supposed to not identify with the struggle, but with their victory. So I look at Moses and say, if God could help Moses get over his temper, God can set me free as well. Maybe you've been afraid, maybe like a Gideon. You can go back and look at Gideon's life and say, if God was good to Gideon and make him a mighty warrior, he called Gideon a mighty warrior. That's literally like God 
God showing up to Urkel, being like, you're awesome, and you're going to fight and kill a lot of people, people that look like the 300, and Urkel's like, who, me? You know that little funny thing he would always say? And God's like, yeah, you. But Gideon believed it after a while because he stopped looking at himself and how big the enemy was, and he started looking at his God and how great he was and how great his victory was. And God used him to do great things. So what are you struggling with today? Maybe you're struggling like David with perversion. You're looking at things you shouldn't look at or being tempted to have an affair or maybe you've done those things and you're like, well, how do I get out of this? David got out of it by God's grace. He set him free from adultery and perversion. Read Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. Forgive me of my sins. I've sinned against you only. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. Come on, that's real repentance from perversion to never go back to it. You look at the examples of Abraham trying to fix it, like, oh, God, you've asked me to run the race this way, but I found a shortcut. What did Abraham create in that shortcut? Basically, the Ishmaelites and the people that would persecute his, uh, his chosen people for the rest of, of the world, you know, the rest of the universe. As long as we're here, we're being persecuted by the Arabs and these nations, and, and that's all because Abraham took a shortcut instead of trusting God. Have you tried to take shortcuts? Have you tried to take shortcuts around the plan of God and then all of a sudden you've got this crazy thing with now that you've got to deal with? And I'm not talking about your baby you got out of wedlock. That's not the crazy thing, okay? But some of you have a baby that wasn't planned that you have to take care of. Can I hear an amen? But let's not call that baby crazy. Let's call it blessed, amen? But how many of you have got some crazy situations in your life because you tried to get a shortcut and you're enduring with them now? Maybe like with me, I forever will have a GED. I will never have the privilege of having a high school diploma because of the shortcut I try to take around God's plan. See, a lot of times we want to say, God, will just forgive me and clean up all my mess. But a lot of times God will let that mess follow you to remind you never to go back to it. Amen? Some of y'all went to the clinic and you couldn't get cured so that you would remember never to go back to that clinic again. Now you've got to carry it with you the rest of your life. I know, <laughs> I know I'm talking to a real church here. I'm being honest with you. Some of you may have to have a talk in marriage counseling and go, honey, uh, i got to be honest. There's some things that aren't right that I take pills for, but I promise to always be uh, true to you. Are you listening to me? There are some things that you're going to have to be honest with as you go through life if you have not done it right because those things are going to follow you. I will forever be a juvenile delinquent. Now, I know that gets expunged from my records, but I'm sure there's some way you can look that up because I took a shortcut. What are we supposed to learn from Abraham? Don't take shortcuts, but even if you did, Never go back. Wait and listen to what God has to do and follow the promise. Amen. You're all too sanctified for, for examples like that. You all still don't have bad credit. You just got saved and your bad credit went away, right? You all don't have any baby mama drama. You just got saved and now all that went away. Come on. Be real with me now. We have situations that will follow us and then we can't just give up now. Abraham couldn't say, well, I made a mistake. There's Ishmaelites, and I'll never have to deal with that. No, he, from, from that point on, Israel, Israel would have to deal with Ishmael. And we look at the things of the Bible that discipline is the way out. And it may not be the answer that you want to hear, right? You may want to come here, Vinny. Let's give it up for Vinny as he comes. Come on. Amen. Thank you, my brother. You may want this brother to tickle those keys, play that soft music, and us pray, everybody get this, us pray every problem out of your life. But God is saying, I'm going to discipline that problem out of your life. When I got saved, I didn't start getting up early in the morning. That had to be disciplined by me missing, come on, missing flights, missing appointments with important people. And God said, when are you going to learn and start being on time? Stop using that as an excuse. See, I had to have that disciplined out of my life. There was a time in my life where I had to say, never again will I over withdraw, uh, you know, my account and be embarrassed in the line. That didn't happen the day I got saved. That happened years later while I was in Bible college. Everybody behind you, I got my groceries. I got my ramen noodles. Boop, declined. Boop, declined. What I have to do? Go back. I didn't have a cell phone then. You had to go back to the dormitory, put it all back, call up my bank. How much do I have in here? You have $12.84. Okay, I'm going to go figure that out now. Come on, but there was a day that I decided that's over. I'm done getting declined. That didn't come just because I got saved. That was because I made a decision to let the Lord discipline me. 
There are things in our lives that we have to take and, and, and see as a process through God's discipline that we're sharing in His holiness. And if we don't uh, quit, we'll see the benefit. But if we make the excuse, well, it's too painful. I don't want to do this. You know what's going to really be painful? is the failures that we face in those areas of our life. Yes, it's painful to go to the gym, but it's more painful to get open heart surgery. It's more painful, are you listening to me, to have to say to your kids, I can't go play soccer with you because I've got problems. It's more painful when you have to tell somebody, now we're going to be sharing a child because we didn't wait to have sex in, in marriage. Now we're going to have to share a child. And that person, listen, because i got to deal with this, that person may not be saved and they're introducing your children for the next 20 years into their lifestyle. Are you listening? It's going, yes, it's painful to wait to have sex in marriage. I know that may be painful. But what is more painful is splitting that child you're going to have between an ungodly family for the next 20 years. That's more painful. What we have to do as Christians is be willing to be disciplined. So when we start praying in a few moments, please be careful what you pray for. Because the Lord will keep his promise to discipline you. And I can't tell you what it's going to look like in your life, but I know what it looks like in my life. It may cost you, you know, uh, canceling subscriptions. It may cost you going out at certain times and places. It may cost you certain relationships. It, it may cost you family members, right? It may. I can't promise you that your family members are going to like the discipline that the Lord gave you. One last story before I got to go, just trying to keep it personal and real today is I had to tell my sister she was not welcome anymore until she got the alcoholism out of her life because my kids had to witness her being drunk, uh, hiding alcohol in a thermos around our family events. Now, drinking in moderation, that's another thing, but my sister lives as a functioning alcoholic, and that was something we dealt with before I had children, you know. Uh, you know, Lisa comes around, we're ready. Okay, Lisa's around. But then once my young children started getting older, now I had to say, Lisa, if I smell alcohol on you, if I see alcohol anywhere around you, you are now welcome around my kids. And now I can count on one hand the amount of times I've seen her in the last 10 years because she's choosing alcohol over being with my children. But I'm willing to make that sacrifice so that my kids don't see a drunk adult or a stumbling adult or a slurring adult or a rambling adult that, that, that's in their home. Amen. So those are the kinds of things I've had to make those, those real choices over. And I don't know. I'm not saying for you, you have to do that. Maybe God's going to use you to reach your alcoholic family member or whatever. But for me, in my house, I had to make a decision. I'm not allowing her to come around in that environment. And she's welcome anytime outside of that. And I've told her I'll pray with her. I'll help her get in a program, whatever. But I can't accept that behavior around my kids, not for a minute. Life is going to come to an end for all of us and we're going to see what we did and what God thought about it. I pray that what you do now lasts for eternity and that you have good fruit because all this other stuff is going to pass away. Amen? I want us to get up to heaven and Him to reward us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. How many are ready for that? Can we stand up? Give it up for Jesus today. Come on. Somebody say it if you mean it. Discipline me.